Good morning, everybody. I apologize, there's some beeping going on in the background. Um, well, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christopher Colwell. Uh, Dr. Colwell is a neuroscientist and professor of psychiatry. Um, he has been a member of our department for the past 24 years. Uh, Dr. Colwell is the director of the Laboratory of Circadian and Sleep Medicine and associate director of the Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Research Center. Um, his research broadly centers on understanding the mechanisms and underlying or the mechanisms underlying circadian rhythms in mammals, particularly with regard to neurological disorders, especially Huntington's disease. Um, his research has been funded by multiple NIH institutes and foundations, um, and he has authored over 160 publications. Um, and as a fun uh, trivia fact, um, Dr. Caldwell was honored with the naming of a new scorpion species. Um, Diplocentris Colwelli uh, from prior field work. All right. Hopefully everyone can see this. Um, right, well, I'm very honored to be here in Grand Rounds. As um, Emily indicated, I was actually first hired here in, um, in, in 92. And so this is my um, coming up on my 30th year working. Well, that originally was um, MPI, but now SEML. Um, and so this is my first opportunity to, to talk about um, my, my research here. And I wanted to, um, oh yeah, I should mention um, conflicts of interest. So um, I, I <laughs> When I, when I was younger, I always wanted to have some conflicts of interest to report on this slide, but um, I, I have a few um, focusing on um, use of um, melatonin, CBD, and, um, and lighting to improve um, the sleep-wake cycle. But for, for today's talk, um, I wanted to um, sort of divide the talk into three parts. Um, the first, just since it's only once in 30 years I get a chance to, to, to chat with you. I wanted to provide some sort of summary and update um, on where we are with our understanding um, of circadian rhythms as a field. Um, sort of, there's been a lot of um, work that's gone on, things that I think are relevant to, to all of us um, that I'm just gonna briefly summarize in the beginning. Um, then I'm going to present an argument, okay, an argument that we should consider disruptions in circadian rhythms to be a core feature of psychiatric disorders. Okay, and this is an opinion, um, obviously not, not a, something which is broadly agreed upon, but nevertheless, that's um, what I want to assert. And, and finally, I want to um, give a couple of examples of studies that we were able to um, publish in this last year um, just to sort of highlight some of the work that's going on um, and how we approach these problems. One of the studies um, will be involving a, a mouse model um, of neurodevelopmental disabilities and, and the other being um, a human study um, um, from Tourette's patients. Okay, so that's what I have um, planned today. So, um, so, so to start, just again, some, some slides to sort of it bring everyone up to date on our understanding of circadian rhythms. So, so I should start with a slide showing, well, what, what exactly defining what a circadian rhythm is. And, and these are um, endogenous rhythms, meaning they're generated from inside our body. The cycle length is close to, but not equal to 24 hours. That's how they get the name circadian. Okay, so approximately a day. Um, they're synchronized um, by, by light um, normally. Um, although we've come to appreciate that the timing of when we eat and exercise are also potent cues for this timing system. Um, and it impacts pretty much everything in our body. When I started working in this field many years ago, you know, we used to publish studies showing this and that were, were under the control of the circadian timing system. But now actually it'd be more um, surprising to find something that wasn't regulated and I've just over here on the right is showing some of the, the measures um, from, from people of, of, of rhythms. But, but basically, um, almost everything in our body varies um, with the time of day. 
And, and so it should not be surprising, um, given the widespread nature of this regulation, that um, this endogenous timing system is under strong genetic control. And um, I should mention that most of my field um, focuses on looking at these genetic underpinnings. Um, and, and you know we won't have that much of this today, but um, it is worth highlighting because um, the Nobel um, Prize Committee just um, awarded, well, a few years ago now in 2017, the Nobel Prize for three of the early researchers um, working out the molecular underpinnings of this timing system. And so I just wanted to, um, it, and I should mention this was the Nobel Prize in, in, in medicine. So, so to just sort of summarize, and I, I, I feel kind of guilty, but I kind of like it too, um, summarize thousands of papers um, in, this, in this very poor animation. Um, here we have the nucleus and, and the cytoplasm inside a cell. And in the beginning of, of the cycle, so you can imagine this is dawn, we have elements, um, clock and BMOL binding specific sites in the DNA that we, we know, driving the production, the transcription of clock genes, um, period and cryptochrome. So leading to the production of mRNA. Okay, the mRNA gets translated into proteins, okay, out in the cytoplasm. Those proteins bind together and accumulate over the course of the day. Um, and near the time of lights off, they translocate back into the nucleus where they turn off their own transcription. So this is just a, a, a simple negative feedback loop, but it's occurring in all the cells in our body, driving rhythms in, in transcription. Okay, and for sorting this out, um, at least you know, one Nobel Prize has already been awarded, and I guess more, more is to come. Um, so, so here is then, if, if you don't like the animation, here's just a little schematic of the same negative feedback loop with clock and BMOL binding the e-box to regulate um, both this negative feedback loop, but also clock controlled genes. And I think in thinking about how this timing system impacts the rest of our body, it's really in all these other genes that are being regulated by this clock. Um, and, and without going into any details, because you don't need to know this, but I think it is important to recognize that within the cells in our body, there's actually waves of transcription that are going on depending on the time of day. So we have some that will be activated near dawn, some near the transition of um, dawn to, you know, of, of lights on to lights off, and then others that will come on during, during the night. And, and this has been mapped out in great detail as shown here. Again, not relevant really um, for today's talk, but I think it is useful to appreciate that there are, um, that really at, at the most basic level, at the turning on and off of the, the transcription of DNA, um, that we have daily rhythms, that we have um, rhythms in, in transcription. So in the production of mRNA, about 12%. Of, of the genes are regulated then. And if we look at the levels of protein, um, about 50% of the proteins in our body are rhythmically regulated. And, and a, another sort of aspect that it's probably important to recognize is the, the set of genes um, that are being regulated by this timing system um, varies with the tissue. So if we're talking about the brain, we're, we're talking about genes involved in inflammation, um, in synaptic transmission, um, and metabolism, for example. Um, there's also robust rhythms in our adipose tissue, our cardiovascular system, or liver. Those, those rhythms, um, different sets of um, genes are being regulated. But, but I guess the key point that I take away from this, and I hope you will as well, is that our, our body is fundamentally different depending on the time of day. So the actual mRNA and proteins inside our cells varies with the function of time. Now, um, there, there are um, mutations that impact the human circadian system. Um, so this um, comes from the first study um, looking at that, which actually was work um, from Louis Pacek and um, Dr. Fu at UCSF, who've been looking at this um, in some detail. And this first family group was found um, in, in, in Utah. And, you know, so the normal, you know, I'm sorry for the table, I didn't have a nice illustration for this, but, um, you know, so the, the controls were going to bed at around 11 at night, 
okay? And, and then, um, you know, waking up a little bit before eight. So those with this mutation then are going to bed at 7.30 and waking up at, at four in the morning. The, the, the clinical complaint was insomnia, but it, it's really interesting. The older members of the family did not suffer from insomnia in the normal sense because they just went to bed early and woke up early. They were, they were uh, mostly working in agriculture and it was probably advantageous for, for them for this, no problem at all. It was the younger people um, that had this mutation that were suffering from the insomnia because they were forcing themselves to stay up late, um, maybe going to bed at midnight when their peers were going to bed, and yet they're still waking up at, at four in the morning. Um, I also just wanted to highlight that it isn't just the behavior, it's also physiology, which is altered by these mutations. And just as an example here, I'm showing the rhythm in um, melatonin onset, which is, I'm going to be showing data from this later on too, but this just shows the, the rising phase of the nightly increase in melatonin um, for, the, um, for these, the, the humans with this mutation and then compared, compared to control. So you can see that there's this shift earlier time for um, all, all of the, the, the subjects. And, and just to, without going into a lot of detail about this, um, it probably is worth pointing out that your endogenous cycle length um, will determine whether you're a morning person or an evening person. And um, I just have this one cartoon here to illustrate this point where this line, these lines just show the midpoint of sleep for people in a um, light dark cycle. Um, so the gray being the, the dark and the yellow being the light. And, you know, so uh, sort of the, the person with the endogenous cycle length for humans, our normal average is 24.5. So, and, and when you were in an LD cycle, we would synchronize such that we would, um, the midpoint of, 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 of sleep will be in the middle of, of the night. But um, some individuals um, have a longer than an average cycle length, and those individuals shown by the black and, and the red lines will, will synchronize such that um, in some extreme cases, the midpoint of sleep is actually after dawn. Um, and that's particularly, we see this most commonly in younger people, um, but, but others, um, there's probably about 10% of you that are morning, morning types, um, that will synchronize, um, have, have actually a shorter cycle length and, and will, will, will synchronize such that, you know, the, the midpoint of sleep is earlier in the evening. Um, and, and I think probably those of you who have, have, have lived long enough will also appreciate that these, that there is systematic changes that occur with aging in terms of um, sort of our sleep-wake cycle, but you know, also this endogenous cycle length. And, and this I'm just, borrowing from a, a friend of mine, um, Till Ronenberg, who, who was plotting, looked at, well, at this point, it was just under 100,000 um, people, although now he's got it up to above 200,000 people, where on the y-axis here, um, they're plotting the midpoint of, um, of sleep. Um, so here's five in the morning, here's 4.30, oops, sorry, um, four. Um, for for both um, men and women, and I think you know. Then on on the x axis here, you can see the, um, the the age of the individual, and and one of the things which always is very striking for me when we're talking about um, young young people is that if you look for um, the midpoint of sleep for the guys, it's around five thirty in the morning, and um, for the women around five in the morning. So um, what that means at you know sort of high school age college age, the, the healthy pattern of sleep would be to go to bed at around one in the morning and, and then, um, you know, sleep um, till, till nine or so. And of course, um, you know, one of the concerns is our school schedules don't allow that kind of um, scheduling. But, but with, with age, um, you know, there is a shift to um, going to bed um, earlier and, and waking up earlier. Um, and the sex differences um, disappear after, after menopause. Okay, so another important thing that we should understand, I think, from the circadian rhythm field has been, and really a great story that, again, I'm just have one slide to talk about, um, is really the discovery of what I think is a novel sensory system 
which is um, a light detection system, which is separate from vision that feeds into our circadian clock. And um, the photopigment is not it's not from like the rods and the cones, but actually it's a novel photopigment um, known as melanopsin. Um, it's localized in our retina, but not in the rods and cones again. It's in a special subset of um, light sensitive cells um, in our retina. Um, it, for those that may recall the anatomy of the retina, the retinal ganglion cell layer, um, about 10% of the cells um, express this novel photopigment um, and that's the light, the main light detection system, which is responsible for, for synchronizing our um, circadian clock. It's sensitive to blue-green wavelengths of light. Okay, so it's, it's beautifully set up to detect dawn and, and dusk. Um, and one of the things, a common theme, I think, that has come out of um, this work is sort of an appreciation for um, how we screw this up. Um, as fluorescent light has very little um, emissions in this wavelength. And so um, for many people, they would find themselves um, in fluorescent lights during the day, um, which the circadian timing system would take as nighttime. And then if you're using electronic devices, video games at night that are emitting wavelengths, light in this wavelength, then um, the circadian timing system takes that as day and wakes up your body. Um, and I think a lot of the sleep disturbances that we see in young, healthy people come from inappropriate lighting. Um, so the site at which these specialized photoreceptors um, project to, shown in the schematic um, down in the bottom left, is, is a site in our hypothalamus, okay, known as the suprachiasmatic nucleus or, or, or SCN abbreviated up here. Um, here. Here's a picture of it with the red cells indicating the cells that are receiving the information from the environment from this um, this melanopsin containing um, retinal ganglion cells and then the green being another cell population together these two cell populations um, which we've studied in some detail um, send signals out that regulate the rest of our body so so what's being sent out so one thing is that the scn is localized right next to the, um, our ventricular space. And so it's dumping out peptide signals that are going um, throughout our cerebral spinal fluid, um, the function of which is not known, but there's about 25 of them that are being rhythmically secreted at this point. Um, there's also um, robust rhythms in um, cortisol and melatonin. Um, and of course the receptors, corticoid receptors and melatonin receptors are widely distributed in the body. Um, this, Timing system also regulates the autonomic nervous system. Um, and that's particularly important for some of, for example, the cardiovascular um, rhythms, rhythms in heart rate and blood pressure. Um, and it also regulates the major arousal systems within our um, central nervous system. And I've just shown um, here, I borrowed a slide from Cliff Saper um, to just show that, you know, and these are all, you know, pick your favorite neuromodulator inside our CNS, you know, maybe for, for this group, it would be um, the serotonin cells from the RAFE, you know, but, but acetylcholine, norepinephrine, dopamine, histamine, um, these are all cell populations within our CNS that regulate arousal are all receiving direct neural signals from the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So if you were recording from a cell in, 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 the, in the RAFE or from the locus ceruleus, for example, it would be rhythmic. Okay, with high um, levels of activity um, when we are awake and low activities when we're sleeping. Okay, and so the way then that this field is is come to understand the circadian timing system is that we have a a network um, of controlling timing within our body. So we have, as I've shown you, this light detection system projecting to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN sending a variety of signals out to regulate um, the rest of the body. Um, and besides these hormonal and neural signals, another, I just want to remind you is when I showed that molecular clockwork earlier, that, that I emphasize that that's found in all the cells in our body. 
So the molecular clockwork, which is found throughout our body is then being synchronized by these cells in the central clock. Okay, although they generate their own oscillations. So if you take out tissue from, from a heart or lungs or fibroblasts um, from, from patients, you'll, you'll, they generate circadian rhythms and gene expression. But normally the SCN um, is most poetically considered like the conductor of the orchestra that's controlling the, the timing of, of, of our body. So it's sending out the beat, which the rest of the tissues are, are paying attention to. Um, now, and I just about finishing the, the sort of summary, but it, it's I think important to recognize and probably you can already appreciate when you have a timing system, which is impacting all the cells in our body, that when you have dysfunction in this timing system, you have a wide range of symptoms, okay? So those include um, cognitive dysfunction, in, particularly, um, in particular memory problem is a lot of memory consolidation is occurring during sleep. And um, when you disrupt the circadian timing, you're disrupting that process. But also um, any vigilance tasks are very sensitive to a disruption in the circadian timing system. There's also a lot of evidence that um, disruptions in this timing system can trigger affective disorders for those predisposed. This has been best studied in um, major depression and um, bipolar disorder. There's also um, through pathways that we understand quite a lot about now, um, inflammation and including neural inflammation results. So for those who are interested, the NF kappa B pathway is very sensitive to disruptions in, in circadian timing. And so you move an organism into an inflammatory state when you disrupt um, this timing system. Some of the um, other facets may be less interesting for psychiatry and yet are very powerful. Um, but um, for example, metabolic dysfunction, I could take young healthy people and within about five days, um, turn them into a type two diabetic um, just by disrupting the timing of the sleep wake cycle. So it's a very um, rapid dysfunction in this cardiovascular disease and GI disturbances occur over, over years of this an increased risk of cancers with the best data um, coming from women um, and breast cancer risk. Um, and, and that's sort of the, the, the end of, of my summary, I guess with this format, I, I would stop here for questions, but perhaps um, with, with the Zoom format, it would be best just to um, move on to the second part. Um, I can't see if there's any, any questions here. Uh, we do have one. Okay. Um, so this is, um, I guess it's saying, so why, why don't you assume that the older Utah people are more normal because they are doing physical work, which is what our bodies are meant to do? Um, and have you done research on physical labor versus working out um, and seeing if there are still differences? So for, for this, um, so the, the group in Utah, yeah, it's really interesting story. Um, so the, the, they were, the younger people were suffering from insomnia, right? So they weren't getting enough sleep chronically. And, and actually it was a grandmother of, of that family that noticed this pattern and um, encouraged the researchers there to, to try to figure out what was going wrong with, with these members of her family. Um, so the, the dysfunction occurs even with, with, without exercise at all. You could take and they did take the people into the lab and show that this basic pattern was shifted to an earlier time zone. But I, I completely agree, I think, with the sentiment behind this. It's not a, and you see that with a lot of the, you know, with, with the genetic alterations in the circadian timing system, it's not what I would consider a disease if the individuals are following their endogenous rhythms. So going to bed you know, for this group in Utah, the, the older family members were going to bed early and waking up early and they did not have any problems with it alone. So it was really just when they were trying to um, conform to a schedule which did not match their biology. And I believe that's the same thing which is broadly going on among um, adolescents um, in, in our, well, throughout the world right now with a very early start time to, to schools here. Thank you. Okay, should I? Yep, you can move on. There are no more questions at the moment. Okay, okay. 
So, so the second part then, um, I, you know, again, this is, this is now more of, more of an opinion, um, my opinion, um, it, is that I, I view um, circadian dysfunction as, as a core symptom of psychiatric disorders. Okay. Um, and, and that it's something which is seen in, in most, but not, not all patients. Um, here. And, and so I really view, you know, I, I had this graphic before because I, I really view that the, the sleep and the circadian disruptions is really a core in, in um, part of, of the disorders themselves. And I'll come back to why I think that's important later on. But um, if I may just summarize again, um, thousands of studies that have been done and um, I'm, I'm working on, on a review article right now, and so I've actually been reading all these studies. But, but consistently, what you'll see among the patient populations that have been examined is um, changes in, in the amplitude of the rhythms, so a lower amplitude, um, less robust sleep-wake cycle, um, changes in, in the phase of the rhythms with delays being the most common, so more common to see um, a later sleep time and, and a later preferred wake time. Um, I'm really intrigued with this and for reasons that maybe we can get to at the end of the talk, but there's um, consistent reports of increases in cycle to cycle variability. So normally this, this system is very precise um, in terms of when in particular you, you wake up relative to the light dark cycle um, when you are synchronized um, to the environment. and and there's, there's been a number of reports of seeing um, disruptions in, in that normal precision in, in timing. And, and I think um, also fragmentation. So um, one of the things which is um, we, we see for, you know, with, well, um, for, for is, is an increase in, um, say, the normal waking up during the night, which, of course, we also see with, with aging as well. But you'll see this even among um, Young, younger individuals. So these, these four um, sets of symptoms are all indicative of a dysfunction in the circadian timing system. It's not the only explanation for them, but um, in, in all case, we can see that in, in, in our models. Now, I wanted to share a little bit of data. This, this is data which um, I intentionally did not pick <laughs> work from our own studies, but ones that I thought may be interested interesting to the audience. So um, I wanted to share a little bit of data from um, schizophrenic patients, okay, which is not a group that I've worked with at all. So I'm really not coming from expertise here, but we, we do have um, some, some nice studies that have been done. Um, so one of the measures that, common, that we commonly use to measure <coughs> the sleep-wake cycle is that these actigraphy um, devices to measure when you're active and not, you know, think of your Apple Watch, but um, with, with, I, I think, uh, with, with better precision to this. And if you put these on um, regular in, individuals, healthy individuals, you'll see, you know, a, a sleep-wake cycle where the person is active. So successive days are plotted one on top of each other. So here's one day, two days, three days, four days, five days. Um, so here's about a month of, of, of time looking um, at activity. And, um, and you know it's people in the real world, so there's there there there's some you know you could see like here I think you'll you'll see like the um, days where this individual had to wake up early for some um, presumably an appointment. I don't know exactly why in in this case. The, these um, blue um, diamonds represent the, um, the 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 peaks in um, in melatonin measured in these individuals. So just, you know, there's variation, but I think you can see um, the um, sort of for, for adults, sort of the, what would be a typical activity pattern for them. Now here are six examples from um, individuals, uh, schizophrenic individuals. This was data collected um, at, from a group at Oxford University. And, and some, um, as indicated by these two examples on the on on the left, are I mean there's there's disruption, but there's also um, you know the, especially the, the melatonin rhythms look um, look pretty pretty normal. Um, other individuals here have extremely disrupted um, 
rhythms. Um, so on, and I think you can just appreciate here's day, day one, day two, you know, the third day, fourth day. I mean, it's, it's almost um, complete absence of synchrony to, to the environment, which was observed. And, and when, when looking, you know, at, at patient populations, I mean, I, I would guess this is probably, I, I thought it was a good representative example because it's, we, we do frequently see a variability in, in the symptoms, but we also see the disruption in, in, in this case, in the sleep-wake cycle. These individuals were not placed in, in the laboratory to measure um, constant conditions. But I, I was, one of the reasons why you know, I, I wanted to bring up this data from um, the schizophrenic patients was that we have um, companion data um, looking at rhythms and gene expression um, from these individuals, um, different set of individuals. This is data from Colleen um, Klung in her laboratory at University of Pittsburgh, who've been looking at the gene expression patterns of um, the individuals in the prefrontal cortex um, as a function of time of death. And, and amazingly that she can demonstrate that the circadian um, clock genes are um, continue to, to, you know, they show these oscillations that she can measure from the postmortem tissue. And um, I don't, again, want to go into any detail with, um, with the gene expression patterns, but I think even without any particular training, you can appreciate these sort of colored patterns where, so, so um, here on the x-axis is the 24-hour cycle. And um, looking then at, at, at a number of, of, of genes, and if you sort of look across time, when, when the gene expressions are high, you'll get the yellow, and when they're low, you'll, you'll, you'll get the blue. So I think, you, in, you know, so here you can see for, there's a cluster of genes that are, are high in the day and low at night. There's also a cluster of genes that are high at night and, and low, um, I'm sorry, um, low, low in the day and high at night. So, so you see these different patterns. Um, and, and here's um, gene expression from just one of the clock genes, the period one gene, again, from, from the human prefrontal cortex as a function, and you can see the, the, the rhythm. Um, and this is something which I'm just, um, was amazed when, when these studies started coming out about three years ago that it was even impossible postmortem tissue to still measure the rhythms and gene expression. Typically before that, um, what researchers have done is take fiberglass samples and you can use um, optical reporters and measure rhythms then from the, the subject's um, fiberglass. But still, um, so then they went on to, to look again at these rhythms and, and gene expression from the prefrontal cortex for um, control, a control cohort and also a cohort um, that had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. And there's, there's a couple of things that this research found that I think is, is really important for us to, to take away. But the first, so this is just the same slide I showed you before, the same patterns with you know, some, some um, high during, during the day and some other genes high during the night. So the first thing they did is they found that, that those patterns were, were disrupted in the schizophrenic patients. Um, in, in many of the top, the, the top rhythmic genes from, from the controls. Okay, so that was one observation, right? Is that the, the normal pattern of, of rhythmic gene expression was disrupted. But the other thing that they found was that a whole new set of genes became rhythmic in, in the schizophrenic brain. Um, and those genes were, were not rhythmic in, in, in the, the, the control subjects. So there, there's sort of two things that were going on, right? There, in some cases, there's a loss of rhythm. And in some cases, there's a gain of rhythm in, in the schizophrenic brain. And, and I think that, so then they, they looked, okay, what, how would you categorize these, these genes? And um, so in the controls, the strongest patterns of, of rhythmic gene expression, not surprisingly, came from the, the core genes that control circadian rhythms, um, but also in, in inflammation, okay, inflammatory markers, which are strongly rhythmic. 
and then um, genes involved in um, intracellular communication. Okay, so these same um, genes were not rhythmic in, in the patient population. On the other hand, um, genes involved in, um, in mitochondria and metabolism became rhythmic, okay, in, in, in these patients. So there were, were really fundamental shifts in, in the, the gene expression patterns um, that were occurring um, in, in, in these patients. Um, and, and so to me, the, again, this is like, so it, it's suggesting, you know, that both that the, the, the gene expression patterns that are normally rhythmic are lost, but then also new genes become rhythmic. The reason, I don't, I don't know at this point, although I will point out there, there is a lot of evidence for metabolic dysfunction in schizophrenic patients as well. Um, and this studies, these studies that I'm just highlighting here, very similar findings have been published um, in the last two or three years for um, major depression and, and bipolar disorder. And again, leading me to suggest that this disruption of circadian rhythms, not just behaviorally, but also fundamentally at the, at the transcription and the translation level, at the molecular biology level, um, it, it may be a common feature okay, of, for, for patients with, with psychiatric disorders. And, and, and so in terms of just my own thinking about, about this, then, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, the disorder, you know, caused by both, you know, combination of mutations and environment, um, you know, originally you're thinking about, well, the disorder then is creating disruption in the circadian timing system as part of the symptoms. But given this fundamental interaction between the, even at the molecular level between circadian rhythms and um, other aspects is I, it's led me to be thinking a lot about this, um, this, this little conceptual red arrow here. To, to what extent is the disruptions in the sleep-wake cycle and the circadian timing system seen in the patients, to what extent is that actually contributing to the set of symptoms that we associate with these different disorders? And, and why that matters is that and it brings me to sort of to the third part of, of and the final part of the talk is that, <clears throat> that there's interventions, there's things that we already know we can do to improve um, the circadian timing system in people and animal models too. Um, some of which are actually, you know, um, you know they're, they're not expensive, it's not high tech. So some of the lifestyle changes that, that would sort of be thought about in the context of maybe sleep hygiene but really are more about circadian timing. One is paying attention to the photic environment to which we're exposed. Um, scheduled exercise, there was already a question about that. Um, exercising during our day um, contributes to more robust rhythms. Exercising during our night disrupts those rhythms and, and the timing of when we, we eat. Um, there's also a number of pharmacological tools. And, you know, I sort of, um, I, I edited a, a, a book on this and, a number of years ago now, really highlighting what we know and what are the interventions that 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 can be be, be done, and and so I wanted to tell a couple of research stories in the last part of of, of the, the the talk, and we've been we've been in in the lab focusing on the timing of feeding and 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 the, and light exposure as being um, is sort of our, our manipulations of choice, although exercise also is effective and we've done a little bit of work with that. And, but, but just again, to go back to, you know, this earlier, um, slide, I just wanted to remind you that, that light is the dominant cue that, that our body normally uses to synchronize our internal clocks. Um, and so for optimal synchronization to the environment, um, people need to be exposed to blue green wavelengths during the day and to avoid this at night. And of course, this is pretty simple if you're living outside, right? It's sunlight, <laughs> this does it. <laughs> but, but, but we're really intrigued with, with the possibilities afforded to us with, with new technology changes and lighting and the movement away from fluorescent lighting, which is a disaster for our sleep-wake cycle, um, to, to LED lighting, which enables us to pick the wavelengths of exposure. So we can have light, which, um, has more blue-green wavelengths during the day, 
and less blue-green wavelengths at light. And I'm really intrigued with that and wanted to, to share some of the, the, the data um, here. One, one mouse study and one human study in, in, in my time. Okay, so, so again, um, you know, although I was talking generally about psychiatric disorders earlier, it's certainly the case that, um, that, that, that kids with autism and other um, related disorders showed disruptions in their sleep-wake cycle, perhaps 80% um, is usually the, about what people find when they look, um, with the most common complaints being delayed bedtime with frequent nocturnal um, awakening. So again, that sleep fragmentation that I mentioned earlier. Um, it, it is also the case that compared to age match controls, um, the, the, the young people with autism spectrum disorders spend more time in front of electronic devices at night. And this has been documented now in, in, in three, three studies um, that, that have looked at this. So more screen time um, during the night. And, and, and so here I want to go into a genetic model that we, we use, which um, is, is a mouse model and mutation in this contactin-associated protein catnap2. Uh, and I'm sure you've experienced this before, UCLA, and especially um, Dan Geshwin and his group here and, and many of his students have, have done a lot of work um, with this model showing that um, polymorphisms um, in, in the catnap2 gene leads to um, intellectual disabilities as well as epilepsy in, in people and, and have been also using uh, mouse models to, to, um, to, to study this. And so we took advantage of this. I wanna just briefly then talk about um, the, the PhD work from a student of mine, Fei Bin Wang is just finishing up right now. Just comparing um, the, the first, the activity patterns of um, the, the, the mutants versus mutants exposed to dim light at night. So we mimicked the light intensity that is emitted from a, um, a, a computer screen at night, five lux. So like a night light, very dim, dim light at night. And first we're looking at the activity rhythms. Um, these are nocturnal animals, so they're more active during the night. And I think the green here shows the, the, the mutants with the exposure to the five lux of, of light. And I think you can see the activity um, rhythms are, are suppressed because of that. Um, they also um, exhibit um, a greater amount of activity during the day when they should be sleeping, um, and also an increase in the cycle to cycle um, variation. So there's more variability in, in when they wake up and go to sleep um, compared to the control. So it's all by this having the night light on, um, which is pretty um, remarkable. Um, we also then, um, since it's mice, we took advantage of that to look at the patterns of gene expression. We have um, reporter systems where, um, where some of the core clock genes are hooked to luciferase, the, um, uh, the, the molecule that allows fireflies to light up at night. And so whenever the gene is turned on, it will produce um, this luciferase, which enables us to, the, glow, the cells actually glow. So if we take the cells out from the central clock and put it in culture, we can record um, rhythms. So here's one day, two days, three days, four days, five days, six days um, in culture conditions from the central clock. So you see in black. Um, and, and then those that were treated with this dim light at night, I think you can appreciate that the amplitude um, is reduced. Um, maybe less clear is if we just follow the, the, the peak of the rhythm on the, the first day, um, there's, there's also um, important and significant changes in, in the phase then of, of these rhythms recorded in culture. So the controls shown um, in the black and then those treated with the dim light at night shown in, in with the green diamonds here. Um, and you know this is just a plot of the, the time of day of the peak gene expression. So we're getting changes in amplitude and phase um, in the SCN, but also um, we can use the same assay to look at other parts of the brain. In this case, we looked at the hippocampus because of our interests in learning and memory. Um, and, and again, um, you can see rhythms um, in, in, in the, the, the control mutants. And then, but then those that were treated with this dim light at night, again, we see a disruption in amplitude, but also a disruption in, in the phase of the rhythm. So again, just something as simple as, as exposure to, to a very dim light at night is enough to disrupt the molecular clockwork 
found both in the central clock, but also in other important parts of, of the brain. Um, behaviorally, we did a whole battery of tests, and I'm just going to share a couple of them with you right now. Um, one, again, this is being used as a mouse model of, of, of um, autistic-like behavior. So um, we, we looked at social preferences um, in the mutants, um, for, which, which already have some disruption. But then if we, uh, again, those that were exposed to the dim light at night, they actually become aversive to spending time with their um, conspecifics. So they're spending more time with, 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 a, with a novel object instead, a different object. And, and the other, um, one of the behaviors that we might measure um, as a repetitive behavior measure is, is self-grooming. These mutants spend um, a lot of time uh, grooming themselves, um, much more than um, the, the controls. But, but again, when we expose the animals to this nightlight, this dim light at night, we're getting um, much greater repetitive behavior. Um, with these assay. Um, and, 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 you know, just, we also look to see, well, what about melatonin is, is commonly suggested as, as a possible um, aid for this. So we, we did try um, looking at um, a nightly treatment with melatonin, again, which is normally a hormone, which is rhythmically secreted by, um, by the pineal under control of the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And, and in, indeed, um, we, we found that the, um, that the melatonin, the nightly melatonin treatment um, did improve the, um, both the repetitive behaviors, um, but, but also some of the, the sleep disruption um, and activity rhythm changes that we found in this. So um, some, some preclinical um, evidence anyway that melatonin could be useful um, as, as been suggested by, by many clinicians as well. Um, yeah, so I, 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 I'll just mention, you know, we, we are currently, we've just finished a major study um, where we're using this, this dynamic lighting, this LED arrays that we can keep the intensity um, set at five lux, but then shift the spectral properties of the light so that it's white light with that's red tinted or white light, which is blue tinted and, um, and ask which one is disruptive or more disruptive, and I'm not going to share that data with you. We've been just finished those sets of experiments, but again, the blue-green wavelength light has turned out to be um, disruptive. So you can still have light on at night. The red-shifted light did not disrupt um, the sleep-wake cycle in, in this animal model. Now, um, okay, but I'm not going to share that data because I wanted to leave time to talk um, to end with a study done by um, Emily Ricketts. Um, here, who was kind enough to introduce me. So I, I'm making her nervous by sharing a little bit of, of her data here as it's the last bit of data in this presentation. So um, Emily has been working with a group of patients um, with, with Tourette's syndrome and, and has documented, um, as has been shown by other studies, that sleep disturbances are commonly reported among these um, individuals. Yeah, picture here of Emily. Um, the way that she did the study is she screened the, the, the subjects before. Um, she also, with the questionnaires, but, but also importantly, she used these actigraphy measures and sleep diaries, um, and also um, the, um, the onset, this the onset of melatonin, again, which is secreted at night. Um, here it shows the room in which she's collecting this data. Um, and, and the intervention then was to give two weeks of, of treatment with the targeted lighting again, focusing on these blue-green wavelengths of light. Um, just, it's kind of goofy, but using a goggles that are light emitting in this case um, to see whether that can have any positive impact. And, and indeed, you know, it, it was just two weeks of treatment, but I think there's some reasons um, definitely to be encouraged about it. First is she was able to, um, to, to, to cause a shift in, in the rhythm of melatonin. It, it's, it's, it's not a large shift, but it's what we expect based on other studies of about 45 minutes. Um, and here's just the individuals showing that, that pretty much all of them um, shifted um, their, their melatonin rhythms by, by just this simple light exposure. Um, in addition, she found um, improvements in their um, self-reported daytime sleepiness, but, but surprisingly not other um, sleep measures. And, and that's something that we can speculate 
perhaps it was just the duration of the treatment, perhaps it's uh, the, the timing of the treatment as we were giving the light exposure in, in the morning. Um, there were small but significant improvements in tick severity um, and small but significant reductions in anxiety among the, the, the test subjects. And I think importantly for, for a preliminary study is that broadly she found that the, 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 the subjects um, were comfortable with this technology um, and, and did not find it producing side effects. And so um, and she published this, this, this last year. Okay, so so just um, in, in closing here, um, just to talk, um, I have a couple slides in closing. So we're we're continuing our preclinical work with with mouse models, and again, our focus is to look for interventions that that work, that we can understand the mechanisms that work to improve the sleep wake cycle. Um, in addition, as highlighted by the work from from Emily, as we hope to expand um, into into patient populations, um, I should you know, recognize that this is, of course, a group effort. Um, and I just have um, the team as a pre-pandemic. I don't actually have the post-pandemic team, but the pre-pandemic team um, shown in this, this picture here. And we, um, we you know, we, we really enjoy being at UCLA in, in large part because we have so many colleagues that we, we can work with um, here on these, on these projects. Um, and and I, I'll just also then mentioned that, you know, one of my, my dreams, I mean, I've been here for almost 30 years and, and what, um, what I would really love to, to see um, established at UCLA um, is, is an integrated center to look at sleep and circadian rhythms where we, we have educational offerings that already have, we have a number of classes we're offering already, but, but also then to better integrate the, the, the basic research and, um, and clinical research and practice here. Um, the, the sleep research community is very, um, I wouldn't say disorganized, but we're not integrated together for sure. And, and there's a lot of motivation among the, the large number of laboratories working in this area to, to do a better job of integrating our, our research. And so we're, we're starting to try to put this together in place now. And so hopefully you'll, you'll um, see some evidence for that. Um, and, and so just in, in closing then, I, I, I hope I've convinced you that the disruptions and circadian rhythms of sleep are an integral part of psychiatric disorders. And one of the things that I, to be encouraging about it is I think that these are, we may not always know the cause of the psychiatric disorder, but there are things that we can do right now to help ourselves and, and our patients improve our, our sleep-wake cycle. Okay, and, and, and I think this, the importance of these rhythms were, has been appreciated for, for a long time, um, and, you know, even the Greeks, but, but I think now we have a new set of tools that we can use and better understanding to target our interventions um, for, for, to improve um, our sleep-wake cycle. And with that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop and happy to take questions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. All right. Yes, we do have some questions. So, so one is maybe more of a comment, but um, so uh, the uh, the data, the actigraphy data from the individuals with schizophrenia was was fascinating. And are there actigraphy data from individuals with mood disorders during active oh, episodes? Yeah, yeah. It's there's there's been um, a lot of work on that. I just I, I picked that patient population just because. Um, it's nothing that we've worked with ourselves, and yet I thought it would be uh, sort of uh, appreciated by this audience. But but yes, comparable um, changes, both behaviorally, but also in terms of gene expression have been shown with patients with um, both major depression, but also bipolar, dis um, bipolar um, disorder. And, and one of the things which is really intriguing with that is that <clears throat> for, for all of these mood disorders, and, and I didn't highlight that here, but it, 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 it's almost that the disruption in the sleep-wake cycle um, foreshadows the um, episodes that are going to emerge in the mood, um, in the mood disorder, um, whereas frequently what's been observed is a disruption in the sleep-wake cycle preceding the, the shift into either the manic or depressive state, for example. And there's a number of, of studies um, in, in, in that. Thank you. And then we have um, a few questions. So what is it specifically about fluorescent lighting that is so disruptive to the circadian yeah. rhythm? And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't have a chance to really talk about that. 
So, so I hate fluorescent lighting. And so you should realize that I'm this biased about it, but so why am I biased about it? Is so I've, I've had, I have these, you know, light detection systems that enable me to look at the output of a fluorescent bulb as a function of the wavelength. And if you, if you, if you look at that with a, a, a just a standard fluorescent bulb, you find that there's almost no light emitted um, in, in the blue green spectrum which means for someone who's interested in circadian cycle, okay, that when we're spending our day under fluorescent lighting, we're, we're in the dark, essentially. Um, our, our body is, and, and I feel that way <laughs> if I spend, you know, I like to be outside for good reason. You know, if you spend too much time inside, you, you'll feel the, um, the weakening of, of the rhythm in large part by, by this inappropriate lighting. And, and there's been at least two clinical studies looking at this, and I hope a lot more on coming online, where, you know, just, just by improving the lighting, um, you know, we, we, can, we can improve um, the amplitude of the sleep-wake cycle and shift the melatonin rhythm um, and improve performance on a number of um, cognitive tasks, especially vigilance tasks. So I, I didn't have a chance to, to share that data, but so, 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 you know, I don't get any haters um, in any emails from fluorescent lighting industry. It's nothing specific about it. It's just the, the light coming out doesn't, doesn't um, adjust our circadian timing. I mean, during the night, maybe it's an advantage because um, it wouldn't have a big negative impact on our clocks, but during the day, it's not helpful at all. And then the next question is, what is the optimal time frame for aerobic exercise to posit positively affect one's circadian? Yeah, and yeah, I get I get that <laughs> asked. I get asked that a lot. So so our our muscles have their own molecular clock, okay? That and and as does our lungs, for example, and and you know controlling um, function of of muscle. Um, so there there is an endogenous rhythm that for most people performance peaks in late morning at around eleven or so. But the beauty of the body in this um, and, and this timing system is that it is flexible. So, and this has been shown, if you, if you take someone who's doing rigorous exercise at, at nine in the morning, the molecular clock, if, if they do it every day at nine, the molecular clock in the muscle will shift to, to so that will become your time of peak performance. So, um, and as long as you do it in the day, it won't disrupt your sleep. Um, I, I, I really do, don't like, I mean, you could stretch, you can do yoga at night, but, but aerobic, you know, sort of aerobic exercises definitely will, will disrupt um, the timing of, of, of your sleep system. And um, so, so it can't be recommended. Yeah, normally I hear uh, not, not to exercise within three hours of bedtime is often what people say, although I'm sure yeah. it's hard and fast. <laughs> Yeah, it's not hard. I mean, you know, when I when I give, uh, I, I sometimes give talks on exercise and the circadian timing system, and there's always someone who raises their hand and says, you know, I go for a run at at, at nine o'clock at night because that's when I have the time, and and they and they go to bed and they sleep like a baby afterwards. And you know, if they're not having any disruption in their sleep wake cycle, then that's not something that's I'm concerned about. But it, it, you know, for for people that are having disruptions, that are having difficulty with scheduling. Um, that it, best to avoid that that nighttime exercise. The stretching is fine. Yoga is fine. Yes. Okay. Um, and then, any thoughts about dealing with the drop off of nighttime peak of melatonin and ADH in the aging population, and any impact on cognition? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, the, the melatonin rhythm is, um, you know, disrupted by by aging. In fact, um, already I can say for all of you, your melatonin rhythm was only about half of what it was as, as a young adult. Um, so unless we have adolescents in, in the audience, um, you know, it, it's already in decline. And, and by my age, it's, 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 it's a quite a bit decline. And, and so for, certainly for the aging population, a nightly um, low level of supplement um, is, is beneficial. Um, there's been a number of new um, drug products out that um, have sustained release of melatonin. Um, I have not seen the data on it yet, but I think that could be a promising addition to um, our, our tools. And I guess we're, we're, we're out of time. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, if you want to send me emails, I'm happy to respond um, and you know take, take questions through that mechanism as well. But again, I really appreciate your attention um, and, and thanks for the invite and have a chance to talk to you. Thank you.
All right. Well, uh, with that, I think we will close the session. And um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, everybody. Have a good day.